Coming up on this Wednesday edition of Daybreak, the death toll from the Sewolho ferry disaster rises to 209 overnight with the discovery of 16 more bodies. Still, 93 passengers remain unaccounted for. For the second time in a month, North Korea conducts a live-fire artillery drill near its disputed water border with South Korea. Unlike last time, no shells fell on South Korean territory. Plus, in an indication the economy remains firmly on the recovery track, Korea's current account surplus widens to more than $7.3 billion in March. Daybreak begins now. Hello and thanks for joining us. To our viewers here in Korea and around the world, it's 6 a.m. on Wednesday, April 30th here in Seoul. I'm Mark Broom and you're tuned in to Daybreak. We start with the latest updates regarding the Sewolho ferry disaster. The number of confirmed dead has now surpassed the 200 mark two weeks after the sinking. 200 Nine people are confirmed dead on this Wednesday morning, with 16 more bodies retrieved overnight. Officials say most of the bodies were found on the fifth floor of the vessel in the lobby. Search and re recovery personnel uh, have been battling against rising tides and strong currents, which are expected to last until Friday. 93 passengers, mostly teenagers, remain unaccounted for, and officials say divers will now work on the right side of the fourth and fifth floors where the cabins are located. Divers have as yet been unable to access that area because the ship sank with the right side down. President Park Geun Hye has apologized to the nation for the Sewol Ho ferry accident. Speaking during a cabinet meeting on Tuesday, the president said she will try and make amends for the government's poor initial response to the sinking. She also vowed to establish a new safety ministry. Park Ji Won reports. President Park Geun Hye apologized on Tuesday to the public for the very disaster that continues to grip the nation. During a cabinet meeting on Tuesday, the president apologized to the people for the government's inability to prevent the accident in the first place and its handling of the situation early on. She said efforts to find the dozens of victims who remain unaccounted for is the most important task right now. To make sure such an incident doesn't take place again, President Park said she would create a national safety ministry under the Prime Minister's office. Once established, it would systematically and efficiently manage responses to both natural and man-made disasters. Earlier in the day, President Park Geun Hye visited the Ansan Hwarang Memorial Hall, where an altar has been set up for the victims of the ferry accident. She paid her respects to those who lost their lives and spoke to some of their families. Park Ji Won, Arirang News. There's been an outpouring of grief in Korea over the Seoul Ho ferry disaster. To pay respects to the victims and their families, a large-scale memorial altar opened Tuesday in Ansan to replace a temporary one installed last week. Our Jim Young-gil was on site and filed this report. Dressed in black, people line up to remember the victims of the Seoul tragedy, bowing in front of portraits and weeping. This new memorial hall opened on Tuesday at a park in Ansan City. The venue is six times larger than a previous altar in the city. It will stay open 24 hours a day for anyone to pay respects to the Seoro ferry victims who so tragically lost their lives. 
When I saw the portraits of the so many victims, my eyes blurred and I couldn't fight back the tears. I imagined what it would be like if my child was on the ferry. The country needs to take full responsibility for the tragedy. Many high school students were seen paying tribute at the mass memorial. Nearly 90 percent of the victims were students from Tanon High School in Ansan City. The victims were high school students like me, and it breaks my heart to think how frightened and cold they must have been inside the ferry at the time of the accident. They had a whole life ahead of them, and I can't help but think that it could have been me. The mass memorial hall is run by the government and jointly sponsored by Ansan City and the Gyeonggi-do province. Thousands of people are expected to come to the Ansan Hwarang Memorial Altar to pay respects to the victims. A total of 17 memorial altars have been set up across the nation. Jim Young-gil, Arirang News. Korea's National Assembly convened a plenary session on Tuesday to address the Sewolho ferry accident. Lawmakers passed a resolution that calls for supporting those affected by the tragedy and helping with the investigation to determine its cause. They also agreed to don donate 10 percent of their salary from the month of May to victims of the accident and their families. Lawmakers agreed the primary focus now should be on finding those who remain unaccounted for. They also stressed the importance of punishing those responsible for the tragedy to the fullest extent of the law. The lawmakers also decided to establish a memorial park and monument in Ansan, the city where most of the victims were from. We start before the sun rises to bring you the latest stories out of Korea. We also lead the way with important global coverage. Stay on the pulse of what is happening with Daybreak. North Korea held live fire drills in two areas close to the de facto inter-Korean maritime border on Tuesday. The artillery exercises come amid a period of mounting tensions on the peninsula. Hwang sang -hee has more. North Korea conducted live fire drills near its disputed western sea border with the south on Tuesday. The exercises, however, were short-lived, lasting just 10 minutes. South Korea's Joint Chiefs of Staff said the North conducted artillery drills in two regions north of the northern limit line in the West Sea, and that none of the 50 artillery shells fired fell in South Korean waters. South Korean residents on five nearby border islands were advised to take shelter. Last month, during a similar drill by the North, the two Koreas exchanged fire across the maritime border after more than 100 North Korean artillery shells fell into South Korean territory. Expecting such a scenario could occur this time around, President Park Geun-hye had told the South Korean military to respond firmly should any North Korean shells land in South Korean territory. Seoul's defense ministry beefed up its vigilance by dispatching warships and fighter jets to the area. The fire drills come amid Pyongyang's threats of something big and unimaginable for its enemies before April 30th. This on top of a threat it issued last month to conduct a new type of a nuclear test. Experts say a fourth nuclear test could be in the works, as recent satellite imagery has shown increased activity at the regime's nuclear test site. During a visit to Seoul last week, U.S. President Barack Obama warned that another test would only further isolate the North and said that South Korea and the United States stand shoulder to shoulder against any provocation by the North. Hwang sang -hee, Arirang News. North Korea will conduct a fourth nuclear test sooner or later, according to a China-based North Korea expert, Yang Shi Wei, a research fellow from the China Institute of International Studies, says that resuming the stalled six-party talks on Pyongyang's denuclearization and giving aid to the country is the only way to prevent North Korea from following through on its threat. He also said he expects North Korea to conduct even more nuclear tests in the future, as the regime has no intention of giving up its nuclear program. South Korea's defense ministry has said North Korea is prepping for a fourth test, but it's still not clear if Pyongyang is just faking the build-up to one. The Kaesong Industrial Complex is one of the last remaining links of cooperation between the two Koreas, with an eye on boosting into Korean collaboration and moving towards 
Unification, South Korean businessmen with operations overseas, plan to visit the industrial park in the coming days. Kim Yabin bin reports. The World Federation of Overseas Korea Traders Association is looking to resume economic exchanges with North Korea. The chairman of World Okta, Kim Woo Jae, along with 21 association members from nine countries, are scheduled to visit the Kaesong Industrial Complex in the north on May 2nd to discuss future investments and plans to establish factories there. Kim said the trip is designed to contribute to reunification of the two Koreas by promoting economic cooperation and hopefully revitalizing inter-Korean exchanges. A total of 41 people are expected to make the trip, including the chairman of the Overseas Korea's Foundation, Cho gi Hyung, and 13 CEOs. World Octa said Tuesday that it first initiated the plan back in February and recently got approved from the two Koreas, adding that it had given business proposals in advance to the North. World Octa is the largest overseas Korean business organization, and several firms are currently in business relationships with the North. Kim Hyun-bin, Arirang News. Now, shifting our focus to the domestic economy, and South Korea posted a current account surplus for the 25th straight month in March on the back of firm auto and computer chip exports. Our Hwang Jie has the details. March was another bullish month for Korea in terms of its current account surplus. The nation's central bank said Tuesday that the surplus stood at over 7.3 billion U.S. dollars last month, up nearly $3 billion from February. Exports of goods rose almost 6 percent from a year earlier to around $54 billion, helped by strong shipments in automobiles, semiconductors and telecommunication products. Imports went up slightly more than 3 percent to 46 billion. The gain in exports, however, came largely from growing demand in advanced economies, with shipments to emerging markets remaining subdued. Korea's exports aren't dependent on just one or two countries, so the recovery seen in advanced nations like the U.S. and the European Union should spread to emerging economies in order for exports to stay strong. The nation's current account surplus has been working as a buffer for any potential capital outflow from Korea that might be triggered by the U.S. Federal Reserve's scale-back of stimulus measures. The cumulative surplus for the first three months stood at over $15 billion. The central bank says the country is on track to meet its surplus projection of $68 billion for all of this year, given that the surplus tends to expand towards the end of the year. Now, in another sign the local economy is on the recovery track, foreign investment banks have raised their economic growth outlooks for Korea. The Korea Center for International Finance says Citigroup has raised its projection for Korea this year to 3.9% from 37 It also uh, upwardly revised its forecast for next year by 0.1 of a percentage point to 4%. Credit Suisse's forecast was positive as well. HSBC says Korea will not experience a long period of stagnation like Japan because there is such a low risk of deflation and the country's market share is on the rise. However, Goldman Sachs warns slowing exports and weakening domestic demand as well as the strong local currency could pose downsize, downsize risks. Samsung Electronics has posted its second straight drop in quarterly profits, but the company says rising high-end TV and smartphone sales should help it rebound in the second quarter. Kim Jion reports. Samsung Electronics reported its second straight annual fall in quarterly profits. While it raked in roughly 8.2 billion U.S. dollars in the first three months of this year, it marked a 3.3 percent drop on year. Sales numbers also dropped to about 52 billion dollars. But the Korean smartphone maker's first quarter profits were higher than its provisional estimates, with an unexpected turnaround in Samsung's IT and mobile business division, which makes up the lion's share of the company's overall profit. It made a slight recovery, posting operating profits of around $6.2 billion, a turnaround from last year's fourth quarter earnings, which came in at $5.3 billion. 
Samsung's recovery is due in part to increased sales performance of its premium Galaxy devices, including the Galaxy S4 and the Note 3. The company shipped out 130 million mobile phones and tablet computers in the first quarter. Its components parts division, which handles semiconductors, also played a role in boosting earnings. But the company's display division, which dominates the OLED panel market, posted an operating loss of $78 million. The forecast for Samsung's second quarter is mixed, but the company says it expects better earnings as it plans to roll out new mobile devices in the coming months and push its new wider lineup of curved ultra-high-definition TVs ahead of the World Cup in Brazil in June. However, Lee Min Hee, an analyst from IM Investment and Securities based in Korea, says a boost in the IT and mobile business division is unlikely, as the second quarter has traditionally been an off season in demand for IT products. Korea based LG Electronics, one of the world's largest television makers, also posted its first quarter earnings Tuesday at $489 million, marking a 44% on year jump. The company attributes its increased demand on global sporting events like this year's Winter Olympics, which spurred to consumers to purchase TVs with sharper displays. Kim Tion, Arirang News. Time now for a look at the international headlines we're following at this hour. For that, we connect live to our Eunice Kim, standing by at the news center. Good morning, Eunice. Good morning to you, Mark. In the latest seizure, pro-Russian forces have taken over a key government post, this time in one of the largest cities in eastern Ukraine. Hundreds of activists stormed the headquarters of the regional administration in the city of Luhansk with baseball bats and, according to Reuters reports, automatic weapons and stun grenades. They demanded a referendum for greater autonomy. Insurgents have now taken public and security buildings in about a dozen towns towns and cities. Interim President Oleksandr Turchinov criticized the local police for their inaction and, quote, criminal treachery. Meanwhile, Ukraine's interior minister Artsin Avakov told the BBC that presidential elections slated for next month may not be able to take place in all regions of the country due to the unrest. And at least two separate attacks in the conflict-ridden country of Syria have claimed, yet again, dozens of lives on Tuesday. Government officials say a series of explosions, including a car bomb, ripped through the western city of Homs. At least 37 people have reportedly been killed and 85 are being treated for injuries. Earlier, mortar shells struck a mainly Shia neighborhood in central Damascus. According to Syrian state media, 14 were killed in that attack while scores of others were injured. Police have blamed terrorists for the attacks, but no singular group has yet claimed responsibility. The attacks come one day after President Bashar al-Assad registered to stand for re-election against calls to step down to help end Syria's civil war. And tens of millions of Americans are still under a severe weather warning on this Tuesday local time as tornadoes stretching across six states claimed at least 30 lives in its path. The hardest hit states were Mississippi and Alabama, where more than 23 people were killed and hundreds more injured. The U.S. National Weather Service says the storm system is set to return to those areas, bringing with it damaging winds, scattered large hail, and a moderate risk of more tornadoes. Tens of thousands were left without power, with the worst of the outages being reported in parts of Alabama and Georgia. And finally, Kenya has signed into law a bill that legalizes polygamy. The controversial marriage law would allow men to take more than one wife without consulting existing spouses, going against tradition, which calls for the approval of the first wives. Female lawmakers called the revised marriage law demeaning and argued that it would change the makeup of the family as well as the financial standing of the women. It was the bill, that is, was opposed by Christian leaders in Kenya as well.
And good morning to you all as we kick things off with some good news in the LPGA. Now, after claiming her first LPGA title as a pro at the LPGA Swinging Skirts Classic, 17 year old Lydia Ko moved up two spots in the latest world rankings. Now, with the Korean New Zealander now with 9.42 points in the latest ranking system, she moves up two spots and is now ranked number two in the world. With an impressive season so far, the teen is able to take over Suzanne Pedersen for the spot. Meanwhile, after finishing tied for fourth over the weekend, Pagimbi holds on to her top ranking for the 55th straight week, just ahead of Lydia Ko. And moving over to badminton, where Lee Yong Dae is set to return to competition after getting his one-year suspension lifted by the Badminton World Federation earlier this month. Now, of course, with the Incheon Asian Games coming in up about five months' time, Lee Yong Dae will quickly get ready for competition as he's set to compete for the first time at the Thomas and Uber Cup in New Delhi. With the event taking place on May 19th to the 25th, he'll be competing in this men's doubles event as he's set to leave to India on the 15th. And now moving over to basketball, where the South Korean men's national basketball team's head coach Yoo Jae Hak released his 24-man preliminary roster on Tuesday. And looks like size won't be an issue for the team as big man Ha Sung Jin is set to return to the national team now that his mandatory military service is over with. Now the roster also includes just one half Korean player in Moon Tae Jong with a packed point guard roster, which includes Kim Tae Soo, Kim Son Young, and even Kim Min Gu. And going into Tuesday night's KBO action, the NC Dinos hang on to beat the LG Twins 3-2 with the SK Wyverns absolutely crushing the Kia Tigers 18-5. We want to take a look at the Tucson Bears take on the Nexon Heroes. Of course, going into the game here, starting pitchers on the night. Two Americans squaring off with Chris Volstead on the mound for the Tucson Bears and Brandon Knight taking the mound for the Nexon Heroes. But the second inning, men on second and third, Kim Jae Ho flies out to right, tagging up his Hong Seung In. And it's 1 0 Tucson. Next inning, men on first and third. Vinny Rotino, an RBI single to right field, ties the ball game 1 1. Fourth inning, Lee Sung Yeo grounds 1 to second. OJ 1 goes home on the plate, but Park Byung Ho is safe at the plate, and it's 2 1. Next play, Moon Uram at bag grounds out to short here. Scoring is Kim Min Sung, and it's 3 1. Bottom of the inning, bases loaded chance for the Tucson Bears, and Hug Young Min draws the walk, and it's 3 2. Fifth inning, more from the Nexon Heroes. Kang Jong Ho with an RBI single to left field. Rotino scores, and it's 4 2. Next play, Kim Min Sung at bat, singles to right, and or check that left field. And that is your final score here 5 2, Nexon Heroes. And finishing things off, SoftBank Hawks Ide Ho hit his third home run of the season against his former team, the Oryx Buffaloes, on Tuesday, but his team lost 5 to 3 at the Kyocera Dome in Osaka. And that's going to wrap it up for me. This has been SJ. Have a great rest of the day, and see you guys again for your sports needs. Well, winds and waves should be calmer than yesterday in Chindo, but the currents remain strong because spring tides started yesterday, which is a period during currents are at their strongest. And as Mark mentioned earlier, this will last till this Friday. And as for the other parts of the nation, depend on what region of the country you are in, it could be cloudy or partly sunny or a rainy day with temperatures similar to a tad higher than yesterday. So more rain is expected in the east, Gyeongsangdo and Gangwondo province throughout the day. And right now the nation is waking up to AM clouds and these clouds could either drop showers in the east or give way to a bit of sun in the afternoon in some areas. So do keep that in mind and let's take a closer look at the readings for today. The Hain Seoul will rise to 21, they will pick to 19, while Gwangju and Busan climb to 20 and 18 respectively later in the day. Now let's see how other regions are looking. It looks like down on Jeju will reach 19, Daejeon peaks at 21, Dokdo will see a high of 17, while Mount Kungang tops out at 10.
Well, that's all for me at this hour, but I'll be back with more updates after 10. Thank you very much, Gian. And those are the stories we have for you at this hour. Korea Today is coming up in about 30 minutes' time, and we'll be back at the same time tomorrow. Until then, goodbye.